morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's uh, Expert Insight Series. Um, today, we are having a look at supporting future development um, in South Africa and what, what can we do as an industry to support young and upcoming developers. Um, today, we've got a panel of experts that are bringing a wealth of experience to this uh, platform for us. And we are going to just run through a little bit of housekeeping before we get going so um, that we can uh, engage and ask questions. Many of you have attended our webinars before, but if you haven't, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there is a little box that says chat. This is where you can pose any of your questions to um, our panelists, and we will do our best to tackle them those questions during the webinar. I also received a number of questions leading up to the webinar and we have definitely taken note of those and, and we'll address them in our um, discussion this morning. Um, during the course of the webinar, there will also be a few polls that will be run. The poll question will pop up in front of you. You can just answer that poll. There's an example of one. You can just answer the poll and um, for those in the panel, just click it off your screen. You can answer the poll and you know, at the end, we will have a look at those results. Those polls are just to keep you sort of engaged and uh, sharing of information. So let us uh, talk about our fantastic panel that we have here this morning. We've got 45 minutes, so let me hip to it. So when putting this webinar together, we needed to tackle a couple of different aspects. One of them was, you know, what is the experience that developers today are having? New guys coming in, but also those are more established. So we were very, very grateful that Urban for Right Side came and joined, joined us today. So Matusi and CS are partners in the business, and they both bring today a different type of information, and they're going to be sharing with us their experiences along the journey and get a better understanding of how property development developments can roll out, some of the challenges that you face, and some of the solutions in the market. The other big side of what we were talking about today is financing and financing structures. This was one of the questions that came up almost all of the time. So we are very happy to have SA Home, La La Home Loans, Home Lands, SA Home Loans and Santam Real Estate with us today. They offer two very different types of products and two different very types of real estate funds. And we're going to break those down and have a look at the criteria that they require. Um, and that will happen a little bit further on during the webinar. So um, without further ado, let's get going. Um, Matusi, thank you so much for joining us. And perhaps you could get the ball rolling and, and give us a little bit of an overview of where your experiences, some of the challenges that you faced through your development career and, 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 uh, and, and where you are today. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. I think thank you to you and Jamie for having us. It's a great pleasure for CSMI to be part of an initiative like this. I think that um, if these type of initiatives uh, were around when, when we started, we would have paid far less school fees than we've paid. So uh, thank you for this and for having us. Uh, just as a brief overview, Urban Foresight is a property development company primarily based in the residential sector. Um, where we participate in other sectors such as medical, hospitality, retail, we always try to partner with best of breed uh, developers that specialize in those sectors. But uh, we, uh, we understand that each sector has its own uh, nuance um, that uh, we can't specialize on personally in every, uh, in every aspect. Um, so we know that residential is our game. Uh, that's where we have, um, we, we've paid our school fees and the, the hard yards have been run. Uh, but with regards to other sectors, we always like to partner with specialists there. Um, in terms of um, the, the, my experience in the, in the property space, I think there's uh, two or three or four aspects that I wanted to, to sort of uh, to highlight. Um, and um, the first is that the right team is so critically important to your success. Um, you can have the right developments, you can have the money available, uh, but if you don't have the right team around you, um, giving you the right advice in terms of the technical aspects, the regulatory aspects, um, uh, service providers, uh, uh, community liaison, 
things as, uh, as seemingly um, uh, unimportant as that, uh, which aren't, um, that can actually be a, 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 a make or break for a project. Um, when, um, when I started my first developments many, many, many years ago, we, um, we, we, we had the land opportunity. Um, we, uh, we had the money available to us, fortunately. Um, uh, but uh, we didn't have the requisite experience and track record. Um, and ultimately that uh, uh, turned out to be my first, uh, my first school fees. Uh, but that lesson um, is not one which is, uh, is lost to me. Um, it, it created the, the full understanding that you really need to have the right type of people around you, whether it's mentors, whether it's service providers, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's co-developers that you're partnering with, critically, uh, critically, uh, critically important. Um, I think the second aspect then, as I alluded to um, when I gave the oversight of, of urban foresight is, a, um, is, is understanding where you want to focus. You can't be all things to all people. Um, especially if you are uh, you are a new entrants uh, to the market or you're an emerging um, uh, uh, developer, um, my 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 advice would be to focus on a specific sector. Do you want to be in retail? Uh, do you want to be in residential? Do you want to be in medical? Because as I said, each of those sectors has their own very nuances, um, which are which are critical uh, to to success. Um, thirdly, I'd say um, uh, finding the right development is also very, very, very important. Um, and uh, your, your, your research um, is, is, is critical to, to that success. And not just market research, uh, for example, going to a market research company, um, speaking to estate agents, but not solely and exclusively. Uh, speaking to other developers in the market in that specific area, very, very critical, but again, not solely and exclusively. Market research, again, important, uh, but uh, I think there can be a tendency to focus purely on a market research and that's taken as, 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 um, as, as word. Um, so I think um, research the area that you want to, um, uh, to undertake your development, and understand the aspects of um, your suppliers, um, the uh, transit routes, all of those aspects. Um, uh, I think that's, that's quite important. Um, and then uh, fourthly, I think understanding from a finance perspective, um, unless you're lucky enough to, 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 to have a large checkbook, um, understanding what, um, what the finances requires and fully, fully understanding that. Because if you, um, if you have signed your OTPs and um, you have made commitments to service providers and, um, uh, and, and, and potential buyers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, you, the, the financiers, you haven't fully understood what their requirements for funding are, that can have a significant um, uh, uh, drawbacks in terms of uh, your, your, the time movement of your development. Um, so I think from upfront, just do your research in terms of, I think uh, the commercial banks would be where most um, uh, new entrants uh, would go. Understand, just do a cursory study of what the general, your big five, what their requirements would be. And then you're able to ask, uh, ask those questions uh, while you're doing your initial engagements um, on, a, on, a, on a development. And then um, fifth, uh, equity, equity, equity. I think that's um, that's what it. Uh, that's where the one of the biggest um, stumbling blocks is, is faced. I think um, I think us as previously disadvantaged people as well. Um, you uh, you know we don't have uh, sometimes don't have the luxury of uncles that have a you know a a a big bank account to our own parents or, or uh, we come from uh, harder backgrounds than others. Um, uh, equity is, is always a challenge. So in the back of your mind, you need to be able to uh, say if a bank comes and they have a, a requirement of a 10 to 50% equity uh, contribution that's required from the developer, I think you have a sense of how you're going to muster um, um, uh, that equity. And I think internally, 
um, uh, CS and I and the team, we've, uh, we, we've uh, tried to be very innov innovative um, uh, regarding that, um, uh, that question, whether it's partnership with landowners, um, um, uh, a variety of, of, of uh, uh, solutions that we have put together for ourselves and trying to answer. Uh, that question, um, because it will always be, and, and, and no matter what uh, level of developer you you become, uh, that will always be um, a question to be to be answered. Um, and then, lastly, in the interest of time, um, Louise, I would say that the property sector is a very, very, very small sector. I think um, uh, you, um, if you are engaging within the sector, especially with the financiers, co-developers. Um, just be uh, very, uh, very cognizant in terms of how you manage those relationships, honor your commitments, uh, don't uh, extend yourself too far in terms of promises, because um, uh, uh, reputationally that could come back to bite you ultimately. Um, and that's one of the creeds that we uh, at Urban Foresight always uh, try to try to live by, because our reputation ultimately is, uh, is the key key to our success. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. Uh, just, I, just before we move on, uh, can I just rewind you one second? You mentioned that the your first development was obviously the one that you paid the most school fees. But when you arrive into that development, you did have land and financing available. Um, maybe if I can just how did that come into play that we that you were that you had access to land and financing you've obviously come from you know been working within the development arena for quite some time was this an opportunity that presented itself to you or an opportunity that you had earmarked hmm. that um that was actually many many years ago and that was my first uh, personally uh, uh, uh property development um, and we were uh, we were approached by um, the uh, the the landowner at um, at that time, and they brought in the land, and they needed uh, primarily support in terms of uh, capital raising um, and uh, uh, mustering the right uh, team around the table. Um, and you, you know we're fortunate we're in the fortunate position that we had the capital, um, and uh, we thought uh, from a high level and intuitively that we can we can put this thing together. And he also didn't come from a property background at that stage, and hence why I say that uh, you learn that your your team and the experience around the table is really really critical to a success uh, uh, for a venture such as that. Um, where would you say your school fees came from? The the negotiations and the relationships, or was it also obviously it's across the across the field, but um, was it the initial negotiations and the relationships with the landowner where you sort of learned a lot, um, or was it that the that the you know the access to professional teams you ended up with a, a product that was quite expensive in the end. Um, I think um, uh, a variety of all of those, a variety of all of those. I think definitely the, the negotiations with the landowner um, up front, I think um, uh, we were perhaps a little bit too generous. Um, that's, the, that's the first aspect. Um, the second aspect was our implementation methodology. Um, I think um, uh, being where I am now, uh, from an in implementation point of view, we would have structured things uh, completely differently. Um, and then um, having, um, ha having the right advice around the table in terms of the various facets, um, I think that would, have been, that would have been critical to us, which we didn't have at that point in time. I suppose that's school fees. School fees. <laughs> the school fees. The you know, you look at your look at the mistakes as lessons, which is Absolutely. the important one. Mistakes as lessons, and the mistakes mistakes that cost money as school fees. And uh, we can certainly identify with paying school fees in business. Um, thank you so much. And I think I think we touched on a very key aspect there, which is financing. So you had a land opportunity, you were approached by a landowner, you learned to negotiate, and, and there was a certain amount of skills that were required there. But you also mentioned financing. And I think this is where Benjamin, I'm going to bring you into the conversation. Um, so, so there isn't 
a lot of financing opportunities available for folks that don't have a track record um, necessarily. And I don't think that's just in development. I think that's in any kind of financial environment where you're wanting to loan money um, and raise equity. So perhaps maybe from um, SA Home Loans perspective and from your experience, you could give us a little bit of an understanding of the types of funds that are available and what are the criteria that loan that lenders look for in a development project? Thank you, Louise, and uh, <clears throat> thank you to all the other panelists as well. Um, yeah, I, I think traditionally with, within the finance institutions or landscape, accessing funding is difficult. And I think a lot of people attach various values to that. Some people will say we in the finance space, we are just difficult because we are. Um, I think <clears throat> any project would need to be viable. Does not matter what the client is that we that we are looking at. So I think that, that that's quite a key aspect. Secondly, the drivers of the project I think need to be very serious about what it is they are trying to achieve. Um, so having had the privilege of working with people like Motusi and Sias is. Um, I think there's a certain attitude that you bring to the table that we as the financiers are able to, to engage with in, in making our decisions. So I think just at a philosophical level, it is not that we as the financiers are sitting here as gatekeepers to these vast pots of money and trying to be difficult about it. What we have done in, in SA Home Loans is a couple of years back, we, we started a housing development fund specifically focused on affordable housing. So we have a maximum price range that we would focus on. So the maximum selling price of the house would be pegged at 800,000, obviously catering for where the big demand um, within our housing market is. Um, and then second to that, we also focus on empowering um, black developers entering this space. So one of our biggest criteria in advancing money is looking at, at black owned businesses. Um, so obviously, I mean, I'm not going into the politics around, around, around those issues, but what we are saying is that's a gap in the market. We are willing to look at it. We are willing to apply a skill set and an aptitude to that requirement where we can say, look, if you don't have experience, we are still willing to consider you. If you don't have equity, we are still willing to consider you. If you don't have a, um, you know, because there's developments at the front end where you find an opportunity, you come, you present it to us, we like it, then you develop it. And in the back end, this is a business that has to run. There's accounting that needs to be done. There's reporting that needs to be done. You may not have all those structures in place. So we are willing to look at that and say, okay, as a fund, we are willing to take some of that pain and see how we can assist you to implement those back end processes to make the, the front end work so much easier. Um, so I think that that's really where we are coming from. You know, I think it's it's to go into the detailed criteria of this is how much equity you require. You know, I, I think would take too long, but safe to say it's affordable housing that we focus on and we are focusing on black new entrants. So your business must be 51% black owned and managed. And that's that's key for us, I think. We've all moved past that stage where someone comes to you with a, a, a land opportunity and you are kind of the driver of accessing finance. And then once the finance is accessed and then you sit there in the corner like a naughty child, minding your own business. You know, I think you, you, we're quite strong. You know, it's a, it's a personal view. And I think it's a view that we hold as a business that the team needs to be involved in driving all the processes. I need to be able to pick up the phone to any team member and say, 
what is happening? Why are things not going to plan? And I must get an answer that makes sense. Um, you know, and look, we don't advertise wisely, but we've, we've, you know, our fund has been been operating for a couple of years. We, you know, we currently have 16 active transactions where we're developing across the country, and you, we funded mainly. I think you know. 90% of the developers that we funded are new entrants into the space. But again, they've shown the aptitude and the willingness to actually, I think Motusi alluded to it, is that it's something you need to live for this thing. If it's, if it's your business, it's something that you must do on a daily basis. You don't just look at the feasibility, see a 50 million rand profit number, and you know that's the driver. You know, it's, it, it must be more than that. Thank you very much. So, so the so I understand the criteria um, from a from a management and a business ownership point of view. Um, size of project is there a limitation or a minimum when it comes to the size of the project? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the development landscape has moved quite a long way in terms of uh, where we were 15, 15 years ago, where guys would come with these massive projects. I think they are still big projects, but they are being phased in a more sensible way. So you can look at a, a two, three, 4,000 unit development, but it's phased in mm. 20 pockets, you know? So mm. we fund on a peak exposure basis. So if you look at what your peak exposure uh, requirement is, you know, we, we could go up to a level of, let's say on an individual, develop of 250 million. That is quite a big development. Um, it's difficult to put it into an, an, a number of units, but I would think intuitively, you know, and th th this may be personally, just from a work perspective is, you know, up to a thousand units would be something where I would feel, okay, you know, that's big enough. You know, I also need, I also think you need to consider the way the property landscape is moving. You know, I, I think things are becoming much more urbanized. So your opportunities are becoming smaller, um, but more opportunities that you would be looking at. So instead of doing one big development, you may, may be doing five small developments mm -hmm. um, in, 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 in order to get people closer to the, to, 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 to the metropoles and in, mm -hmm. instead of on, on the outskirts. So that's probably where I would peg it at, at, at a thousand units. And um, I mean, the, the thing you mentioned that there's a support structure in place. So the back, re, back room support structures and, and, and expertise that you would share with a team that are, are accessing this funding. But there are other areas like infrastructure that needs to be in place and all of, all of the other sort of requirements of the development. Does, would this fund uh, be applicable to both the to the both the bottom and top structure. So would you fund the infrastructure along with the, the building and, yeah. and, and further yeah. works? Yeah. And, and do you supply, would you then work, assist the developer with how do they engage with municipality? How do they engage with the, those resources? Yeah. So we look at it from the start of the development post zoning. So I think we've, as Motusi has paid his school fees, we, we in the financing space, we've paid our school fees. I think, um, you know, zoning processes are, you know, it's, it's rough waters to, 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 to navigate. So we would typically say your property needs to be zoned or as close to zoning as is possible. Um, but then from if, uh, if land is owned, we would get involved in the acquisition of land, uh, bulk services, internal services, top structure, and then obviously uh, the sales process to, 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 to the end user. So we would get involved from, from that point right to the end. Um, and a question you might not be able to answer, but I'm going to ask anyway. How, how does the cost for this type of financing uh, compare to that of a traditional bank? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I always, I always think. Sorry. 
Mm-hmm. No, it, it, it's not. You, you know, I can I, I can give you the the kind of textbook answer or you know or, or the leaflet answer and say. First, you must consider we are a fund. So traditionally, we'll be more expensive than a, a bank. You know, we, we don't have those whole f- wholesale facilities available. Um, but we are not much more expensive. But then you, you also have to look at, you know, where you lose on, on one side, what you gain on the other side. So traditionally, you may go to a bank and the equity requirement may be higher and our equity requirement may be lower, you know. and the bank may have a higher pre-sale requirement. We may have a, a lower pre-sale requirement. I think, you know, I, I always, my approach to any client is, it's your choice. <laughs> if we sit around the table, I like a development, we can agree on terms. There is nothing that stops you from saying, this doesn't work for me and you may go elsewhere. And I, I think, Within our space, people don't do enough of that, where they actually investigate and understand. You know, so people would look blindly into one number. If, if, if we partake at an equity level and we say, for the equity that we put in, we want a 25% share, they would immediately translate that into an interest rate that you are being charged on your global facility, saying effectively you are now charging us interest of. 17% as an example, which is not true. You know, one type of financing is not another type of financing. It's, you know, debt funding is debt funding. You know, if, if I'm charging you 15% on debt funding, by all means, compare it to someone else. But, you, you know, so I think, you know, like Motusi indicated, as you do within the development space where you educate yourself, you know, go through the process of also understanding what the different financing components mean, you know, because these aren't necessarily always vanilla transactions. You know, there is structuring that happens. There is different levels of debt that comes in. So, you know, it's it's, it's not just a question of looking at one number and saying that is the end result. But yeah, I, I mean, it, it would be difficult for me to put a, put a number, my number to it and get many phone calls trying to commit me to that number. <laughs> I understand. So it's weighing off the value, uh, it's value versus cost and yeah. the value that you would get from that from those additional added value services like the support structures and the insight versus the cost of the capital. Um, thank you very much. And I think this brings us to a, a really nice point where we can chat, bring Cole into this discussion because there are many types of financing models out there. And uh, some of the questions we have been asked through from the audience, you know, are those accessing those different types of models? And what Santum Real Estate brings is another dimension to your process of, of looking for funding, a different type of funding, uh, when, it, when you are uh, doing this research that Benjamin mentioned. So thank you so much, Ben. Cole, if I could bring you in at this point, and perhaps you could tell me a little bit about the Santum solution, how you're approaching younger developers. I know that you work with a number of large uh, well-known successful developments you have a number of projects underway um, but maybe if you can give us a little bit of insight on, on how you're approaching this market that we're talking about today thanks so, so let me just start off with maybe what the solution is and then i'll just drill down a little bit from there so the solution generally is based around equity um, and you know that's a, a a famous point that comes up all the time, right? From uh, from developers, whether you're an experienced developer or not, you're going to have to have some equity. So what we've designed is is a guarantee product, which would then be issued to the financier, um, which then acts as a uh, as as a portion of your equity um, to the financier, which then uh, facilitates a higher level of of funding. Right uh, in in broad terms, and that and that the equity guarantee. Uh, remember, Santam as an insurance company, we're not a lender of money. But what does that piece of paper allow you to do? Is access maybe a higher level of funding or access another type of funding? Right. So what is what is that guarantee or what's the, the forms of it? It generally can take uh, one of two forms. 
Number one is pure equity, right? Is where, you know, maybe SA Home Loans say they want 10 million rand in equity and that's it. And so we can, and, and the, the wording of the guarantee with its triggers and so on is designed specifically for that. The other type of guarantee, we can morph it into potentially a, um, a, a top up pre sale element to that, right? Which is also another sort of hurdle with, within the, the residential development space, let's call it that. Right, and if I don't know, 40 units need to be sold, but you have 20, 25, or 30, we then would assess that and say, all right, well, maybe here's a guarantee will be issued to the financier that says this e e equals 10 units. You know, so so the financier sees that sees that as a bulk sale, and then allows you to access the funding earlier, allows you to get on site earlier, allows you to build, and then you know people like to to buy what they see. And so hopefully speeds up the sales process also. So from a high level, that's what it is. And then if I want to go into to the next part, okay, so how does that help um, new developers? And so from a, a risk point of view, that, that's the sort of angle we would take on any of these transactions. As an insurance company, what's our risk, okay? As a, as a new developer, what you're never going to get away from is the project risk. And I think Benjamin mentioned it. The project must be feasible. No matter who you are, the project must be feasible, right? So that's the first thing is we look at the project risk itself. And Mutusi kind of touched on it. Is it the right product? Is it in the right location? Is it servicing the need that's going to be there? Is it at the right price? All of those sorts of things. Um, and so... Project fundamentals, absolutely. So we're going to look at that. The second thing is your ability as the developer to deliver, right? And that's going, that's the next big risk because if you deliver, allows you to pay back your funding, whatever shape or form that funding is, right? And so that's typically now where we actually have to say, all right, so how do we view a new developer? Right? What is a new developer? Are they a bunch of uh, people who've had individual experiences and now have come together and formed a new entity. That's one way of looking at the risk. So, you know, these people have done it, maybe not in this entity, but they've done it. So they have a level of experience. Or is it just a new entity first time? Uh, I don't know if this was you, Matusi, but somebody who's got a piece of land who has an opportunity and now they want to build something, right? That's a different type of risk together right and so we have to look at those as from the developer funny enough i just want to add this is that yesterday i was talking to a, a developer client of mine who i've actually seen grow through those stages from being a first-time developer to a larger type of developer now who's expanded over the years and he, he, he made a very interesting point he said when we first started uh we didn't know how little we knew about what we knew, right? If that makes any sense, but it kind of does. As, as good as they were and as good as the experience that they did have as individuals, once they got into it as their own entity, they still had to learn things, right? And that risk is always there for us as such. They still had to learn things. And what was the secret source for them? And I'd like to say this to new developers. What was the secret source? It wasn't magic. They partnered with somebody who had been there and done it before, right? That, that's what it really was. So instead of making 100% of the profit, they made a little bit less, right? But what that allowed them to do is do development number one. Then it allowed them to do development number two. Then it allowed them to do development number three. And they built the track record and their risk profile now also changed. And so again, our looking at it from a, from a risk perspective is if, if the project is feasible, that's one box ticked. And then the second part from, from a developer perspective, what is the actual risk? And so we've got to then take a deep dive into that. And of course, who are the professionals around it? Who's involved in it? What have we done before? And again, like I was saying, is that um, 
my advice, especially if you're starting, if it's your first development, um, partner with somebody. Um, it's, it's certainly, you know, don't make your millions on your first deal, right? If that's what, what you want to do. Build your track record, build your risk profile. Cole, so, so you mentioned partnering with somebody who's more established. Um, that's quite tricky to find the right, the right partners and to negotiate the relationship with a new partner. So, so when it comes to looking at those risks, do you find that you're in the position to uh, advise people and to assist people around that type, that side of the negotiation of um, accessing new developers that might have a, a approach you but need, need that support from other developers? Are you in that position where you can recommend and advise? So let me answer it this way. I think we're in a very similar position as to any other funder who, who has uh, client relationships and, and has relationships with other developers. And we've done it in the past where we've put uh, a younger development business in the room with a more experienced development business, right? But what also has to happen is the people element has to also work, right? So a, a deal on paper is a deal on paper. But if you don't have a relationship, that's also not going to work, right? So we can always put you in the room as a new developer with two or three people, and, you know, yes, you, you, you want a certain thing out of it. And I suppose Benjamin made the same point. You want a certain thing out of it as a new developer. The more experienced developer wants a, some, something out of it. And a deal on paper can be made. But I think what's also very important is a meeting of the mind from a relationship, pers uh, a personality perspective as well. Uh, uh, a, a vision of what you want to do in the future also needs to to come into play. So it's not just necessarily the, the numbers on, on a piece of paper, it's also those elements as well. So yes, we can do that. And I'm sure, you know, uh, other funders also have that ability with, with clients that they've worked with. And some of our developer clients as well are telling us, look, we want to work with somebody. We also want deals. We also want transactions. They don't have exclusive, uh, you know, rights to, to every single transaction or, or project that's out there. So they're looking for those type of people as well. Um, you mentioned that perhaps you could put the guarantee in place around the equity difference. And I know this is something that comes up often. The, once you've secured financing for, you know, perhaps 60% of your project costs or 70% of your project costs. And not, I'm not talking about pre-sales, I'm talking about what is that a contribution by the developer. Um, the what would a developer need from a from a, a um, security point of view if you are then um, accessing that equity difference? You know, it, it, and would someone like SA Home Loan accept that guarantee if if it is offered? Yeah, well, without speaking for SA Home Loans, let me start with that that part now. Is that Okay, so, you know, sometimes balance sheets is a very listed entity and sometimes is the largest sort of short-term insurer, not only in South Africa, but the rest of Africa, you know, and we've done this with, with other commercial banks. So I, I don't necessarily think that's an issue, um, but let's start with what's required, right? So managing the risk is, is, is certainly a requirement from a Suntown perspective. And so we also look at who's involved in the project. But from a security perspective, there's, there's no doubt that the risk environment has changed. COVID also has taught us a few things. So we've also learned school fees from, from that as well. So what sort of security are we looking for? Well, the first thing is that we want to also see that user developer have spent a portion of your own money. Whatever that amount of money is, you must be invested in this also. There's no doubt I think CS was saying it earlier, is there's no doubt that being in the property development space is a cash intensive industry, okay? You are going to spend money and you're going to have to spend money if you're going to be in this. And so we want to see that also. So that's one type of security. We want to see that you've spent your money. Secondly is we do look at balance sheet security. And hence I say, 
partnering with somebody also gives you that ability okay, to, to fulfill that requirement of security. Yes, the asset itself is a form of security, but generally the main financier is going to bond that and they're going to you know, take 100% security of that in any event. So we, as, as Santum, would have to look outside of that. What additional tangible security is there? And I don't want your fancy, you know, Toyota Prado or something like that. I want other fixed asset type of security. Okay, so you're not going to take my Toyota Conquest. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> I'll try again. Um, okay, so fix, you're looking for a, a fix. So regardless, there's no getting, I'm trying to see how do you get around uh, putting skin, your own skin in the game and, and the long and the short of it is you can't, you know, whether you're getting, a, however you're going to finance a project, you need to, you need to look very long and hard at where your personal or that of a group of your consortium or of your uh, group can come come to the party. Um, as we roll on towards the end of this uh, webinar, I think it's really important. Uh, thank you so much, Carl. See us. Um, you bring a wealth of experience, and I'm sure that we could speak to you for far more time. So I do apologize that, as always, the time goes so quickly. But I think the next layer of what's important here and another set of questions that came in is negotiating with the landowners and getting these sort of share agreements in place, understanding and negotiating with professional teams, because how do you entice a professional team onto your project? Um, we, as you can say, as an industry, and it's a very catch-22, you have a group of very professional teams that are working on a large number of projects, but you also have an emerging market of suppliers and service providers that can assist, but don't have the experience and therefore increase your risk for you as the developer. Maybe you can give us a little bit of an understanding of how you negotiate, personally, how you negotiate this minefield. Thank you, Louise. Um, I'm going to try and rush through this in the three minutes that we've got available. Um, I think I think the first thing to understand uh, when it comes to developments is everything starts with the identification of a project. You you need to identify the need and find the land that we where, where you can fill the need, um, either through purchasing the land or doing a transaction with the landowner. Um, I think for, for new entrants into the market, if it's not a landowner that's your uncle or your father or a family friend or somebody that you know through business, it'll be extremely difficult to, to entice a landowner to do a JV with you um, on their land. Uh, I think at, in, in that sense, they almost like the banks. They would like to see a track record and, and a CV. Obviously, as you progress and you can show that you've, you've delivered projects and, and that you've uh, got the capacity to, to uh, finish the projects successfully, um, landowners becomes more and more enticed to, to go into a JV with you. Um, obviously, in a situation like that, uh, we tend, myself and Matusi, uh, to offer the landowners a very decent stake in a project. Uh, we offer them, uh, obviously, whatever the asking price is, uh, as long as it's reasonable. Um, and, and in addition to that, we offer them a healthy percentage of the profit margin. Um, we also don't uh, let them sign sureties. We'll sign sureties on transactions. And the landowner's his, his risk is his land will be bonded at the end of the day. Um, so he's got a bonded... Uh, uh, risk um i think when it when it comes to professional teams uh, louise again um if you've identified the land and you've identified the need uh, and you have secured it through some way in or form uh, there's mul multiple uh, professional teams out there that will get involved in projects unfortunately however none of them do it on risk especially for non-experienced uh, developers Again, that's something that, that does come with time as, as you deliver projects and, and develop and, and professional team members uh, notice that you are actually delivering and they do get paid at the end of the day. 
they do tend to come on board on risk. Um, but that, that happens much later on in the process. Um, I think uh, the, the main point is the development space isn't an easy space and it's not an easy space to access. Um, your, your barrier to enter is actually quite high. Um, and, and without partnering up with a developer or a team of professionals, it will be very difficult for anybody to enter the space. Um, so, so my proposal would be is that if a new developer has identified a piece of land and they identified the market, go and knock on doors, uh, speak to developers, approach developers, get them to, to chat to you about the land, sign an NDA with them, they won't circumvent you. See if they won't partner up with you. And, and I think as Carl alluded to, take 10% of the profits, start but start to build up uh, your own equity pot and own CV slowly but surely over time. Uh, it's not something that happens overnight. It takes years and years and years and years for people to actually be in a position to call themselves property developers. Um, yes, Louise, I think I can continue to, to ramble on and, and say a million good and bad things. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we're out of time. And, and uh, I think we can pick this up in, in a future uh, webinar, perhaps, where we uh, drill down into the feasibility side of things and identifying the right needs and where does the market lie, um, because that will take us uh, 45 minutes on its own. Um, thank you, CS. Uh, just, just a couple of questions. I know we're running out of time, but let's just quickly tackle them. Um, you mentioned, you know, if you have found a piece of land and you've done your own feasibility sort of considerations or you've brought in a, a small team to help you with that feasibility you said knock on doors so would you advise that you take the project yourself to potential investors and develop co-developers or should you go through an estate agent or some sort of uh, organized company that could broker on your behalf uh, Louise, I, th I think it, it depends on how confident you are in your, your um, negotiating and sales skills at the end of the day, because you would have to sell yourself and your project to that developer. Um, uh, I, I personally haven't really found brokers that, that's in a position to introduce uh, developers necessarily. Um, I think uh, where, where we've met most of our contacts was through, and initially especially, was through the financiers. Um, and and uh, people like Call, who would introduce you to their network of contacts. Um, so yes, uh, I would I would rather try and get in with a Ben or a Call, and ask them to to point you in the right direction. Um, have you found in the past that you have struggled to get uh, a co-developer to see your vision for a piece of uh, uh, development? And how did you tackle that? Absolutely. Um, I, 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 very few people share the same vision in business. Um, and I think that's, that's at the end of the day, the magic and the people that you need to find around you is people with a vision that you share. Um, and, and if the developer doesn't share your vision, it might just purely be based on vision or their experience in that market sector and they don't see it working. But I say continue. If you believe in your project, continue to knock on doors. You will find somebody that, that will partner up with you um, and, and do a bit of skills transfer and, and get you into the game. Um, there was just a mention as well in one of our questions earlier that um, if you identify land in existing urban areas, so maybe sort of areas where you've got in space, you know, interspaced open pieces of land. Um, is there a, how do you access information about who those landowners are and if you want to sort of approach them for a development? Have you had that experience before? Yeah, um, I don't know whether a new uh, Papaya at uh, how easily you'll be able to access the information, but but in the past you were able to to 
uh, draw some some reports on on landowners from various websites, uh, paid property information reports. Um, but currently, with the new Papaya Act, I actually do not know if that information is still available on any portal. Um, and then just a, just a question. So in your experience, studying something, so going off to university or doing a course or, uh, you know, learning the, the basics and the ropes before you, you, before you start in business, would you, would you recommend that if it's, a, if it's an affordable option to you? Or um, do you think you should sort of jump in at the bottom and climb the corporate ladder, so to speak? Um, Louise, I think there's a business case for both both options. Um, I would say if you've got the opportunity to access a university, go for it and, and study something. Within the property sector, it could be architecture or engineering or property management um, or just some short courses. Uh, educate yourself on, on, on the development space. Um, if, if you don't have the opportunity, um, I started off as a estate agent. Um, that's, that's where I started learning the ropes. And then I worked for an attorney firm uh, and worked in the Leeds office. And from there, I worked at the bank and did some bonds. So, and then I went to site and I worked for a developer on site as a site foreman. So climbing the ranks, uh, I, I'm a, a, a believer in climbing the ranks. Uh, learn how each part of your, your sector works. Uh, obviously, those options aren't available for everybody. Um, but I, I think both, both uh, uh, avenues have pros and cons and, and can be followed. Absolutely. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for sharing your insight. As you see, time flies when you're having fun. And there's, uh, we've recorded this for those of you um, that would like to view this recording again. And um, we will continue to share information. Um, I am happy to connect anyone with the panel if you would, if you so wish. So please, uh, Jamie has popped my email address, louise at estate-living.co.za. You're more than welcome to contact me directly and we'll take it from there. Um, thank you so much, gentlemen, for attending. We, I think this definitely is the start of uh, what I hope will be a in very informative um, set of series of webinars for this particular market that are looking to move into property development. We definitely need to share our expertise so that we can build a robust system for the future and, um, and, and see, and there is so many opportunities for job creation and so much more within the sector. Um, thank you all for your time and thank you to everyone who's joined us. Uh, Clem, would you mind popping the video on? Mm -hmm.